All right. Mano Amigos, we are about to interview Justin Small uh, from Do Make Say Think. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, Do Make Say Think is currently uh, one of my favorite bands uh, of all time. They play kind of a, it's considered post-rock. Um, we might get into the, the writing for post-rock a little bit more in the interview. Um, I've got my Do Make Say Think shirt on. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've only seen, I got into Do Make Say Think a little bit late, uh, just before their last album, which is Stubborn Persistent Illusions. Um, I got into them, and so I've only seen them perform live twice. One time was at a huge show in Toronto. I can't remember exactly the place, um, but I think it was their their main show once Stubborn Persistent Illusions was released. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited for this interview. Uh, we'll wait for his... Actually, I'll probably stop until he comes. I joined in. I'm excited for this one. Uh, I, I'm excited for all of them. But this one, I've never really talked with Justin Small, other than he sold me, actually, this shirt. Uh, but I've never actually talked to him in an interview. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous for this one. All right, Rob. How's it going, man? All right. Um, maybe to start, we'll just start way back at the beginning. And uh, for what attracted you to music and specifically guitar and got you into kind of this world of music? Uh, when I was about my daughter's age, I don't know if you will, this one may, won't make sense because we weren't recording then, but, uh, uh, she's eight turning nine next month. And, uh, uh, I was terrible at soccer, terrible at, uh, baseball. My dad tried real hard to get me into kind of those things. And, uh, I think it was my mom who really just caught on to that. I was always wanting to go buy records and listening to the radio all the time. And uh, so my grandfather, uh, for one birthday, just bought me an acoustic guitar just because he didn't know what to buy me. And he, my mom was talking to him about that stuff. And then I just started playing the guitar. And I did not uh, get along with the music team. I grew up in a place called Ajax, which is a suburb of Toronto. Not a very nice place. Uh, 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 pretty much burned all my bridges on the way out because um, I live in Toronto now for the last like 25 years, maybe even 30. Yeah, I'm 47. So I left when I was 17. So yeah, 30 okay. years in Torontonian. So, um, but then, uh, yeah, I just kind of, kind of went this way and then uh, kind of found a love for heavier music. Like I really liked Iron Maiden and like Rat and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Nice. They, they just weren't doing it for me, so I kind of moved on to like Metallica and Megadeth, and then you know, and then Slayer, and then and then I made the quantum leap to like Napalm Death, uh, um, Bolt Thrower, all those English death metal bands. I just kind of wow. deep into that, and me and one of the drummers in Doomix, Jimmy, uh, we had a like a death metal grindcore band. And we even put a cassette out. Okay. <laughs> we released a cassette and we were in that whole early, uh, late 80s, early 90s tape trading scene and like fanzines and like complete underground, like completely underground, like no, no, none of that. And then when I was 18, I moved to the city and met Charles, who's the bass player in our band. And he kind of opened my eyes to a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, on the way out, I had already just, uh, on the way out of Ajax, uh, I had was hanging out with a bunch of people who were really into extreme music, but it also on the peripheries of extreme music was uh, were bands like uh, My Bloody Valentine, uh, you know, Spaceman 3, uh, Mercury Rev, um, all these kind of like bands that did a lot of... Um, okay. <laughs> We're going to get interrupted every once in a while by an eight-year-old. So. No worries. No worries. Uh, um, and then uh, I just kind of ended up uh, just moving in that direction. Um, but I kind of, I've never given up on metal. 
Uh, I have one band tattoo, and it's a giant one, and it's of Napalm Death. I got, like, you know, I and I got that on my 40th birthday, so. Oh, wow. It's never left me, but I, I did move towards uh, more experimental stuff, uh, the Chicago scene uh, with, like, Jim O'Rourke and Gaspar Del Sol, and, of course, Tortoise is, like, obviously, if anybody listens to Do Makes a Think, you can really hear that influence. Um, yeah, spiritualized uh, became a big influence, and then um, really got into jazz. Really got into, uh, but like you know, good jazz. And uh, I started working at HMV when I first moved to Toronto, and then quickly moved to like uh, there's a class. There was a classic record store uh, in Toronto called the Record Peddler, and I was. Uh, honored to have found a job there and then there's another store in toronto that's been here forever and i put in a decade there called sonic boom and uh yeah so i've always been at record stores always buying records always exploring in fact i bought a record yesterday that saw called uh witch egg mm -hmm. and yeah i think it's it's one of the guys from the ocs doing like free association music with like it's it's kind of jazz. It's kind of like Miles Davis in the Jack Johnson to Bitches Brew era. Just really strange and weird and oh wow, kind of kind of groovy and yeah. So that's just kind of my love for music is just kind of blossomed that way. Yeah, when when you were starting out and you said you got an acoustic guitar, but you yeah. were into metal. Um, were you just trying to play metal riffs on the acoustic guitar or? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> was there a certain point when you said, okay, if I'm going to play metal and you started with a metal band, uh, when did you go out and get like an electric guitar and maybe some pedals and. Well, I got gifted, uh, an electric guitar, um, uh, and an amp, a small trainer, one of those like. 15 watt like little practice amps but the thing about those amps which we actually uh, uh if you are going to show photos or anything you'll see them in the background uh charlie plays through two of them uh and i play through one of them in in conjunction with uh like a full ampeg stack and then another stack so i have like three amps that i play through uh it can be quite deafening uh but uh when i was in grade seven my uh, mom bought me an electric guitar and the thing about these little tiny amps is that if you just turn it all the way up past five it doesn't get louder it, it just gets distorted oh okay and that's when i kind of realized oh that's the sound of, of metallica or you know like that's and then i just kind of started playing that stuff and learning i, I i've been, never been taught except no? for when i was like a, when i first got the acoustic guitar my mom put me in guitar lessons and i was like Oh, I think. We... Um, you know. Okay, sorry, I just missed the ending. You kind of cut out for a second there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, my mom gave me guitar lessons or paid for guitar lessons, and the guy was just wanted me to learn like Beatles and like Grateful Dead and all this kind of stuff, and I just wanted to learn Metallica and Megadeth, and so we kind of had a cross, like we kind of butted heads, and I did. I just stopped taking lessons and. It's kind of like one of those things where if you're a kid and you have like a, a dentist who's kind of mean to you, your anxiety level goes up even as an adult going to the dentist, even though as an adult you have a really good dentist. <laughs> you still, yeah. like, oh, man, I have to go to the dentist and you get really like kind of tensed up. So I just uh, stopped, stopped lessons and just started to learn on my own. Okay, yeah, that, that seems like a common theme that I hear, like when I interview people is that at some point, a certain teacher and I got to take this in a, as a good lesson for me uh, is is trying to push them to learn a certain song. And if they and, and that sometimes detracts people either from lessons or from learning and uh, that it, it's more engaging if they can learn the songs that they're interested in. Right. I agree. Yeah. 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 And, and also, you know, uh, someone like myself, 
who has unfortunately uh, lifelong um, struggles with like learning disabilities and you know dyslexia and, and such, uh, which makes it actually very hard to read sheet music being like a dyslexic because things kind of sort of dance around for, for you. And if you have to, you always have to look like two or three bars ahead and let your body kind of flow through it. It's like the delay, like you look at it, you're a bit ahead and your body's just flow it, like trying to catch up, which is what I think reading sheet music is like. I know uh, a lot of the people in, in do make uh, read sheet music. So, um, and in fact, uh, our trumpet player, Michael Barth, uh, who got his doctorate. So he's Dr. Michael Barth in, in trumpet. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, uh, um, he and Ohad would just like uh, Ohad, the other guitar player for your students, yeah. um, uh, would be in the van while we were on tour, and Michael would show him a piece of sheet music, and he would just look at it. Ohad would just look at it and go, "Huh, that's cool, man." You know, like he would hear the melody yeah. in his head just by simply looking at the sheet music, and I'd be like, "Oh, well, no. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy to me how people can do that." <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so, so even like you were saying, you started out, I, and I want to get back to kind of how you're playing and stuff like that. But with the genre, it seems like like the genre of metal seems closer to um, lullaby orchestra, yeah. uh, which is a bit heavier, yeah. but not do make say think. So, do you think that it was some like you meeting Charles and you meeting these other people that uh, kind of pushed it to? I, I guess a do make say think is kind of classified as a post rock type sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Charlie moved in when I moved to Toronto. I moved with James, uh, the drummer from our metal band, and he also was an Ajax guy. And Charlie moved into with us as a roommate, and with him he brought a Tascam T88 eight track reel to reel recorder. And so when he set that up, we had no place to put our TV. So we threw our TV out and we just spent our evenings uh, uh, recording hours and hours and hours of like, he also brought like a Moog Prodigy and an ARP Axe. And, you know, and I started getting really into delay pedals and we would just spend hours and hours recording. And then eventually Charlie was like, we should start a band. And we started a band and it wasn't really informed by anything other than like, I think metal, my love of metal, uh, it didn't take a backseat, but it took like a sidecar. And what I really liked about metal, what it really taught me in terms of the post-rock uh, ideal, I, like uh, idealism was that, you know, and to, and to say that I was only into metal, it was false. I was also into like punk and hardcore and all that kind of stuff. And I really loved also Discord Records, who were fiercely independent and fiercely underground and did not give, like, a single shit. Uh, am I allowed to swear? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they didn't give a single shit about what, uh, whether they were popular or not. They didn't care whether uh, the press picked them up. They, didn't, they, they, they hated Rolling Stone. They hated spin they hated they didn't need to be on the radio screw the radio they just had their own community and their own idea ideas and uh and post rock sort of fit into that even though it wasn't heavy music but it's still uh it's it's difficult music sometimes you know yeah. a lot of it has kind of gotten into sadly over the years into a formula like the loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, um, you know, for 18 minutes. Uh, I mean, I think Godspeed, you Black Emperor, kind of cornered that and everybody else should just try something new. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, uh, for us, you know, it was funny when uh, our last record, Stubborn, Stubborn Persistent Illusions, came out, uh, they played, um, uh, <laughs> they played about 30 seconds of Bound and Boundless. And the guy was kind of reviewing it on, on the air. And he was like, I don't even know what to call this music. I, I don't even know what this is. And he goes, this thing goes on for another 14 minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, like that's about as much press as we got for that record. <laughs> but 
it went on and uh, was nominated and won some Junos. Yep, that's right. Which was a a, a, a remarkable shock to all of us. <laughs> well, that's super cool. I like I and the artwork. I I believe it. Did it win? I've got it right here. Uh, did it win the Juno for the artwork? It did. Yeah, because the artwork on it is unbelievable as well. Thank uh, you. You can thank Marianne Collins for that. It's the first record we did outside our own band with the artwork. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it turns out it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I like all the uh, the albums and all the different artworks and things like that. Um, for, for Do Make Say Think, just a off story about me and listening to do make say think i uh i i we did an audio comic uh like an audio story on the air and at the time i had not heard of do make say think i was very uh one one music minded and um which is why i kind of asked what broadened you your uh, music music uh creating this audio comic we were just trying to put in and feature as many canadian bands as we could and uh i found the song uh fredricia or fredrica okay. yeah, and right. uh put that one in the back and i i was floored by how good it was so okay. then i just started buying uh do make say think albums on record and i wouldn't listen to another do make say think album until i could track it down on record and uh, <laughs> listen to it on record so for me, kind of the, the chronologic order of it is all out of whack because I just got them in the order that I could uh, find them. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I, like for me, this interview is so cool because um, I found out about Do Make Say Think. I think it was, was it Other Truths, which was your last one before uh, Stubborn Persistent Illusions? Correct. And, and so when I when I found out about you guys, I thought, oh, well, you guys have broken up and you're no longer a band anymore. And so I was collecting. And then I we were, I think, in Toronto watching another show. And I saw that you guys were playing the one time. And then we had to come back the next day all the way back to Toronto to see. So I've only seen you twice and once since you released the album. But right. um, it, it's amazing stuff. Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> uh, it, keep keeping going here um, with, <laughs> with with your practicing. So you were saying that like uh, Ohad has got more the the music theory, but yeah. you in when 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 I see you play, and one of my favorite videos is the um, when you're in uh, I think at, at the house of Strombo, sure, in, in his basement, and even in that. Uh, and and when I've seen you live, you go from instrument to like you're switching instruments during performance. And sometimes you're playing guitar to bass to organ. There's got to be some type of understanding and musical theory to be able to do that mid performance. It's an interesting question. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it theory. It's more uh, about the moment and kind of feeling the moment and then and then remembering the moment you know just like okay i'm supposed to go to the keyboards right here like or i'm gonna let charlie play for a bit and just let that feel out and then when i start playing my keyboard line it's going to send a signal to one of the drummers that the next part of the song is happening you know okay. it, 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 it's kind of that like in terms of theory to tell you the truth if uh I don't know if you can see it, but uh, ooh, yeah, see all of these like <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to play where the tape is. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, cool. And that's like I kept screwing up this one part, and Charlie finally put tape on the keys, saying, "You play these notes." <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of you know one of my uh, uh, one of the, one of the things I was going to show you, kind of just like in terms of method. Oh, this is my theory. Here's uh, one of the things I use to play where guitar. <laughs> That's a it, screwdriver. A screwdriver. You know, and I play it through like you know all kinds of pedals and. Oh wow. You know, uh, that's oh this one right here. 
I don't know if you have our first record. Yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, first distortion pedal I ever got. It's called uh, the Boss Super Feedbacker and Distortion. Uh, and that is the sound of the song Disco and Haze. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, so for my, if we're going to talk theory, uh, uh, Ohad is sort of in the zone of classical training in his theory. Uh, also, um, uh, he took harmony training. He went beyond. Like he he he's interested in that kind of stuff. He he spends his evenings online taking courses and doing that kind of stuff. Uh, I spend my evenings plugging into delays and playing one note and seeing how long it goes. <laughs> so no, yeah, that's kind of that's where I'm at um, in terms of theory. I mean, jumping around the stage playing different instruments. Uh, I would say is more a combination of feeling and focus. Because you gotta, our, our song structures can become uh, very open and loose, but they always come back to one moment. And it's always one person who triggers that moment. And we all have to be listening to it. And it's, that's kind of the most difficult thing about it is uh, in terms of theory, if we're talking uh, free form theory. Uh, is that it um, uh, It requires you to, A, be in the moment so that the song has this organic, rolling feel to it, but you also have to be paying attention. And not only paying attention, when you hear the signal, you get ready, and then you have to go, oh my God, what's my part again? You know, like, because you yeah. may have been like so in the moment that you just go, like, oh crap, where do I start? And then for whatever reason, muscle memory takes over and you just hit the right note and off you go. And you then you're in the next, and then all of a sudden you're in the next part. And then you look at the set list and you're like, you know, you've already played for 25 minutes and you're like, oh man, we've only played like two songs. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, we got another seven songs to go. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes those make for the great show, the best shows though. Uh, yeah. They're kind of on stage kind of offshoots from the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were uh, the, we're, we're the best, okay, there's two things. We're uh, the best uh, Do Make Say Think cover band in the world. Uh, <laughs> and it's simply because we uh, construct our songs in the studio and we take different parts and we glue them together and then we write parts to, you know, make them come together more naturally. And then uh, once our record is done, uh, we have to learn it. So okay. it's almost like a cover band sitting around a record going, all right, let's play this. Oh. How does this song go again? And then uh, usually by halfway through a tour, like about the midpoint, we're the best band we can be. Like we've okay. warmed up, you know, and then we're hitting like Paris or hitting like, you know, Germany. And then we're just hitting like France and we're just like, you know, we're doing really good. And, uh, and, then, and then we get tired. And then the shows start to the show the songs start to speed up. <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody wants to go to the hotel and sleep. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, that show at the Danforth Music Hall that was that was really special. I was really it's probably one of my yeah. favorite shows I've played, and it almost didn't happen because our drummer injured himself. But he he ended up. I heard about that burnt himself or yeah. something. Yeah. Oh boy. He's, uh, he burned himself and he didn't go to the hospital immediately, so it got infected, and then he ended up in the hospital. And we were, uh, and he got out of the hospital like two days before the show. Oh wow! Yeah, that's so crazy. We, we were a well-oiled machine, uh, and and you know what? Uh, kudos, uh, kudos. It was Jimmy. Kudos to Jimmy for uh, he 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 was nothing. He was a professional. He he knew all the parts. He, he, I think he was practicing in his head while he's in the hospital, and he's just stepped up on stage. And I, you wouldn't have guessed he had, uh, he he had injured himself until I sold him out on stage. <laughs> I remember him. that. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he wasn't. He after the show, he wasn't too pleased. But uh, no. I just got him a beer, and <laughs> he was okay. <laughs> now, but. So you guys take a, a bit of a break and do you ever have for a show like that, like that was a huge show. 
And uh, do you ever have going on stage uh, any type of performance anxiety or did you when you started or it was just like an adrenaline rush? There's a, a, a I think all of us do. Uh, I, and I, I would I would be skeptical of any performer who doesn't at least feel that on some level. Uh, like I'm, I'm probably certain David Lee Roth is, you know, amped more than nervous. It just seems that way. But I can't imagine anybody that has any kind of like, uh, I don't know, like reality inside of them doesn't feel at some point right before walking on stage that kind of, you know, anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that anxiety I always find is uh, due to the fact that you really care about what you're about to do and you really want to make a great show and, uh, um, and you really want to, uh, I don't know, not impress people, but be one with them and create an environment that you all share together and that's always kind of nerve-wracking like it's like you know uh i identify of course as a uh, not of course but i identify as a heterosexual and it was like kind of like when you'd meet girls uh it's that moment you know they like you like you know that you know and uh you want to go kiss them and you, there's that, like, you know it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But there's that moment where you're like, <gasps> like, your hands are sweaty and you get kind of like, yeah. you know, you know, and that's, it's that kind of a feeling. It's, it's more like excitement that causes, like, sort of a stressful anxiety until you walk out on stage and everybody's like, you guys are here. And you're just like, yeah, all right. Okay. Now I'm in. That's, or, or mostly for me, it's, uh, after you land the first song and that's because our songs are so long it's a uh, it's about 12 minutes worth of anxiety and then you finish the first song and people cheer and you're like oh right <laughs> like, and then it's just easy to, after that we're here to enjoy each other we're here to have fun right so yeah that's kind of the that's the crux of it uh uh, uh i don't drink anymore but uh wine was helpful <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell my students about that one. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit, just, just, just a touch, you know. Take you the edge past, off. Yeah, you go past that, and you're gonna be walking off stage at the end, and you're gonna feel terrible because you played a bad show, right? So, yeah. you gotta keep that in check. Yeah. Um, going back, you were saying when you're when you're, like for me. I can't even imagine putting together a uh, do make say think song because when I listen to it, it almost sounds like uh, a symphony on rock instruments. Right. And there's there, there's so many different things coming in and going out and, and, and happening. When you're writing a song or putting together a do make say think song, um, how how does it kind of flow and come together uh, with, with with your with, with the different people who are playing their or, or like how do you think I'm gonna go to the organ for this song or to the keyboard or where you're gonna go during a, a different song as you're composing? Uh, it it kind of flows from the symbiotic relationship that you have with every other member. Now the five core members are uh, uh, like me, Charlie, Oha, Jimmy, and Dave. We've like, we're, bro we're like, it's family, we're brothers. You know what I mean? Like, and we act like brothers, like we insult each other. We, you know, get into arguments. Uh, we, we've gone through like, you know, tragedies and, and, and triumphs and, and all kinds of things together. Uh, you know, I always feel like I can call any one of them up if anything is happening in my life. So you have that kind of, that's a, an important part of creating music and having a relationship. And it's also an important part as, as to why it took us eight years to come up with a uh, stubborn persistent because after other truths, we didn't officially break up. We're not kind of ever going to break up, I don't think. Uh, but it was a moment, I think, in mostly Charles' life where he decided he wanted to explore different things. And, 
he made the happiness project, which he wanted Juno for. Uh, he wanted to focus on broken social scene. And in between all of that, Leslie Feist uh, took him on tour as a multi-instrumentalist. And oh. so we were kind of like, okay, Charlie is just, you know, and it ain't do make safe thing. We can't replace Charlie. Like of the five of us, we can't replace one of them. So it's the five of us or the band's over. So basically, Charlie, we didn't say it was over, but Charlie needed to go do his thing. And that's when Ohad and I decided to partner up and start, you know, scoring for film. That became our kind of way of uh, continuing the flame. And then eventually Charlie came back from all of that eight years later and him and Dave just started jamming for fun uh, just because he's bored. And him and Dave go way back. Like they're old school friends with Ohad. Uh, they're old high school friends. So, uh, and me and Jimmy, I met Jimmy when I was three years old. So, you know, that's the kind of relationship we all kind of have. And he uh, uh, started jamming with Dave and they started sending us MP3s of it. And eventually I was over at Ohad's working on a film and I said, you know, these are kind of sounding good. Like maybe we should, you know, join in on this. And then eventually you kind of get into this zone where someone adds to something and someone adds to that. And then it kind of starts to move in a direction. And then you also, you often get like, sometimes you get into arguments about like that part doesn't work or like uh, uh, sometimes egos get in the way. Like if you try to tell the drummers, don't play that beat, play the beat that's in my head. And uh, we have two drummers and uh, drummers don't take shit. They're not, they're not having it. They're just, they're just simply not having it. So you kind of, that kind of slows the process down a bit, but eventually, uh, you know, you just, if, if you can let go of your ego, you can let, you can uh, let the creativity flow. And that's, okay. uh, and that's a challenge. It's a big challenge to let go of your own uh, vision, you know, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we eventually find common ground, and those are the songs you hear. And if that uh, has me and Charlie running around the stage, you know, <laughs> like getting other, you know, doing instruments, you know, picking the organ and then picking the keyboard and then grabbing the guitar and then putting that down and grabbing the bass and then picking the guitar back up. You know, it, sorry, I keep touching my face. I don't mean to. Um, uh, I think it's just, I'm on a, it's an interview. It's an interview thing. I just, <laughs> um, you know, eventually uh, it just becomes section, second nature doing all that dancing around. Um, like in, in the song Bound and Boundless, when that like heavy organ happens, that's Charlie. But he's also playing guitar at the beginning. Oh, no, he's playing bass. No, no, he's not. Ah, he's playing. Ah, he's playing something. <laughs> but then he has. He has. To, he has. I have to give him the guitar. No, he has to give me the guitar, and then he starts playing that thing. So we actually at one point reach in between each other, like oh, okay. shoulder, and he kind of puts his arm underneath my arm while handing me the guitar, and then he hits that chord, and I walk. Oh wow! A circus trick. <laughs> <laughs> That I don't think a whole lot of people catch on to, but that's uh, that's 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 the nature of the beast in Dumix, I think. Yeah. So w w with your other projects like um, Lullaby Orchestra, would you approach that with a different mentality because it's there's less like there's less of a core group in the uh, with that? Well, it's me and my wife, right? Yeah. And so we just I think early on just went, you know, like. So okay, that's loud and fast. She'll come up with a riff that's loud and fast, and I'll just play drums to it, and there's a song. Okay. <laughs> you know, our songs come out pretty easy. Uh, we rarely have any problem with them. Like, even if they're kind of on the, like, more uh, unpolished, let's say, let's not say crappy, <laughs> let's say unpolished side, um, you know, uh, we like it's 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 a perfect tonic to being in do make say think. Like I'll I'll give you an example. Uh, do make say think sound checks can last up to four hours long. Oh you know, wow! 
with all the all the instruments, oh. all the plugging in of stuff, and then and then checking every instrument, and then playing songs that have this instrument in it, and then it's just like it's uh, uh, Lullaby Orchestra doesn't do sound checks. No, oh. no, we show up to the show, we go up to the sound guy, and he, we say we need two microphones. Okay, see ya. Yeah, <laughs> and he's like, "What? Like, can I go home now? Like, have dinner with my wife?" And we're like, "Yeah, we don't need sound check. Who cares?" And he's like, well, what's it going to sound like? And we're like, you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, my wife played through these, like she bi-amped uh, with her bass. And so it's just bass and drums. And uh, she had two giant stacks. Like that was her, you know, oh, wow. yeah. like she had like a one A10 cab with a, a Ampeg head on top and then two uh, uh, 410 cabs with like a trainer monoblock just a beast of a sound wow yeah all she, all she played through was this thing the the new big muff big muff that was it though that was the only pedal and it was loud like i'm deaf because of that band it's like it was so loud <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it I, i've never seen them but based upon the recordings with, with all the yelling and and uh fast playing <laughs> it sounds like it would be yeah it's a good time. I used to set my drums on fire. You can look that up online, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will have to check that out. I haven't seen that. Yeah, just, just type in Lullaby Orchestra and drum on, drums on fire. Okay. <laughs> something, something will come up. Nice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link to that, too. <laughs> um, now, you, you were saying, too, that you're getting into uh, score writing. Yep. and. Did did that was that a natural progression? Because I feel like a lot of your solo stuff, and one thing that I I, I feel you're amazing at is uh, putting almost like an atmospheric on a sound, whether it's do make say think or even lullaby orchestra. It's got this nice atmospherics to it. it it's hard for me to explain other than that. But your solo stuff seemed like that's what it was largely based on and it almost seems like that would be an easy transition to jump into soundscaping for movies yeah it, it actually was uh um, like i said when charlie kind of after other truths decided to kind of go on his own direction uh i met one time uh this editor uh who was working with uh bruce mcdonald if, if, if that's not familiar with you you know the famous canadian director he did like okay. hardcore logo uh and like a ton of other like classic canadian movies um and he was saying the editor was saying that i'm cutting to do make say think and we're gonna hire a composer to to rip that off He's, and then i was like wow that's crazy why don't we do it? Like we're in do make say think like we can rip yeah. ourselves off. And that sort of started the journey. And, uh, Oh, and I've been doing it now for about 12 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. We've got over 60 credits to our name. Holy smokes. Yeah. That is awesome. And we won a, we won a Canadian screen award, um, for a film that we did, uh, a documentary. We mostly are working in documentaries, but we're starting to branch out into, uh, um, you know, features. That's sort of our our big goal is to get oh. into our feature work, which we've done. We've done that before. We're no strangers to that. But uh, it just seems like uh, our name. Once you start working in that world, you get a name for yourself if the work is quality. And over the years, uh, we just have become the go-to documentary dudes. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's very neat. Yeah, yeah something, something came out in, I don't know if it was this summer or I think it was at some point during like the, the shutdowns with COVID where there was like a Spitfire uh, uh, sound uh, creation contest where you could put music in the background of, uh, I don't know if you watch Westworld. Westworld uh, was, uh, I don't know, just a, a bigger TV show. I, I don't know if it's on HBO or what. But um, and they had kind of information on how to do it as well, using GarageBand or Logic or something like that. So I, I'm very new to it. But when you mentioned it, it, it intrigued me because this is a new thing that I've just started to incorporate into my 
uh, Com Tech classes. Right. Well, if, if you end up editing this part about score work um, into whatever the class you decide to, how you decide to edit this, uh, if you include this part, uh, the one thing that I've learned, and even though, uh, you know, I luck out because I work with Ohad and he's classically trained, and not only that, uh, he worked in post-production for film before he, we started this, like, actually scoring for film. So he knew how to deliver a film in stems. He knew how to, he knew how to talk the talk. He knew how to walk the walk. Uh, when directors would put us in contact with the post house where they're going to do the mix and color correct and all that kind of stuff, like Ohad could talk to them. It wasn't a mystery. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they could say all kinds of technical stuff to them, how they wanted stuff delivered, in what format, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, time code stamping, you know, two beeps, like all this kind of stuff. Um, he understood the language. So I, I you know, I, 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 I didn't start from the, the very bottom. I had a partner who was very much one foot in that world already. But uh, what I will say is, and this was kind of the hardest thing to learn as an artist, and a lot of music uh, people getting into score work uh, fail at this miserably, and they, and they end up not getting a career out of it, is that you have to learn to let go. It's your music, and you're working with them, but it's a collaboration. And if a director comes to you and goes, like, you write this piece of music and you love it, and it works so good for the scene, and the director comes up to you and is like, this isn't working, you got to lose this. you got to come up with something different. And then they play you some song from, like, the Last of the Mohicans soundtrack, and you're like, oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> and then you just got to do it. Like, you just got to get up in there and... And what we end up doing is we take those songs that directors, uh, 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 you know, throw to the side and we put it aside. And if we're working on another project, we'll just go, huh, remember that old cue from that film? Let's pop that in there. And often, nine times out of ten, the, that director that on the next project will be like, this is beautiful. Like, this is really working. And so it's like, um, like a something that's pickled it never really goes bad <laughs> you know if you can find a, a home for it but uh yeah that's the one thing I, I found the hardest uh when we were first starting out was uh to not have your feelings hurt to not have your ego bruised to the point where uh you fight you get into a fight with like the director or the producer you know i know a lot of musicians i won't say who they are who have tried their hand at this and they kind of approach it as it's my art, like like you take my art as is. While you're not Hans Zimmer, like even Hans Zimmer, uh, if we took his master class, even Hans Zimmer was like the director would call him up and be like, "No, you know, no, I don't like it." Yeah, and that's hot. The dude has won like twenty Oscars. It's almost like you can't say that to that guy, but people do, and he has to uh, he has to listen to them because it's it's not his movie; he's just a part of it. Right? Yeah, so, he's getting paid know, and, by. Yeah. yeah, and generally nine times out of ten, we never get hit with something that's just like stupid. And and if we get hit with something stupid, you know what? Suck it up. Just suck it up. It's not like you're you're selling your soul to the devil. Just here you go you this is what you want and you're happy so we're happy and you know nobody has ever come up to us from our music community and been like oh my god dude that <laughs> that, that movie with the i don't know what was that i was like oh <laughs> but nobody's yeah. really done nobody's really done that so i don't know if any of your students want to get into score work just uh check your ego at the door <laughs> that's it Cool. You got, you got like you probably got your own stuff going on. Just go back to that to save your soul. And the more and the more you kind of get into that idea, the more projects you start to work on that are genuinely artistically sound and good and beautiful. And you know, then you're in that community. I feel like I'm in that community right now. Like there hasn't been a project that's come on our desk in the last three years that isn't like, you know, 
like emotional and uh, beautiful and, and allowed us to like really spread our wings and and like about four or five of them won like top awards and you know you just get into that world after you try and uh again check your ego at the door yeah 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 that's some great advice <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> um for, for for me, first time I think I heard "Do Make Say Think" was "Goodbye Enemy Airship." Uh, well, it was Fred Fred Reese, Fredrika. How how would you say it? It's it, well, it's it's a town in, in Denmark. It's it's called uh, well, no, it's not the town. It's, it was like a a building that was like a, a, a art center, and it was called Fredericia. Fredericia. Okay. Yeah, Fredericia. But uh, the first whole album I had was Goodbye Enemy Airship and I, I I couldn't believe it I would just put it on and like where a lot of people now need to be doing something like watching a video with me but it was enough just to put that on and sit and listen and, and it was unbelievable is there one maybe from that album or a song or something that you have a connection with like a, that is like your biggest connection towards one of your own songs that you you no. is it no. all of them or no it, it it's a record you know like i think a lot of people especially like thinking maybe if you'd asked me maybe 7 years ago before people really got into streaming and making playlists and doing Spotify and all that stuff. By the way, I do not have Spotify. I do not have Apple Music. I do not have, and I don't, and I'm not trying to be like cool about it. I just think uh, there's a fucking devil. Uh, they don't pay anybody. They're, they don't pay anybody. You make a fraction of a cent. One of our songs has been streamed like over two million times and we got the royalty statement for it and we all made seven dollars that's insane like that's yeah. so fuck them sorry for the swears <laughs> uh, um but uh like if you'd asked me seven years ago i probably would have said the landlord is dead or uh um min min i always loved playing min min live it was always like super fun um but now, uh, given this kind of climate, it's it's a record. Like it's a front to back. Like that's we make records. We don't make singles. We don't make EPs. We don't make uh, garage band drops. Uh, none of that. We don't even put. We one time put out a B side record when we were first touring Europe in the nineties. Oh, God, that sounds so weird to say, huh? Oh, <laughs> in the uh, that one besides. <laughs> That one took me <laughs> yeah, forever besides. to try and track down. Yeah. Well, they only were supposed to make uh, 500 copies. And then we found out that the label, uh, Resident, um, nice guys on the surface, but uh, we ended up finding out that they were doing a repressings uh, to the like a couple of thousands. Oh. And they just simply weren't paying us. Oh, wow. So I think, I think I think we sick constellation on them like a rabid dog, and they ended up, you know, a good old cease and desist, and they tracked down how much they owed us in royalties, and these these guys had to pay us. But uh, yeah, that's the only one we did, and that was supposed to be a bonus uh, just for the European tour, like just for the English part of the European tour. We were supposed to only sell it in England, um, and yeah, it's a hard one to track down. I've got like two copies at home, so oh, yeah. I'm not getting rid of them. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like we we always have outtakes from our records, and we just if they if they're not good enough to make the record, it's not good enough for you guys to hear. You know, yeah. we're, we're not fans of just being like, here's the throwaways. Now, sometimes uh, of that, we'll uh, when making another record, we'll mine one or two ideas. It's just that the, the the song that happened around it didn't really land, but that guitar riff was great. Why don't we just redo that? You know, so yep. a couple of songs on on stubborn persistent have that. It's okay. like we were stuck for a part, and we're like, hey, remember that song that we did in the like 1998 that didn't make it to Goodbye Enemy Airship? And then we'll just take that riff and we popped it in on that song, 
The song was Hor Horripilation. Okay. Uh, yeah, it has. There's a guitar riff in there that's just like was made in 1998. You know. And cool. Yeah, it was, we were like, we were so surprised how it landed, and we were like, yeah, okay. So. And and you remembered it because of the recording, or someone just happened to play it, or. Uh, it's an it's a, it's an Ohad riff, and he was just he was just uh, warming up on a while well, we were writing the song, and he just was just he just as a joke he just kind of turned to Dave Mitchell and started playing it, and uh, and we're like wow you remember that riff wow wicked and then Dave came up with a beat uh, that uh, was way better than the beat he came up with like in the nineties, like because it had now been like over 20 years yeah. uh, and he was a much better drummer and he just came up with this wicked beat and we were like wow there it is, there it is. <laughs> yeah. And cool yeah totally cool um yeah so you know uh what was the question again <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> we kind of got off on a good tangent there so. yeah thanks sir um, <laughs> you were saying you had a good story about Goodbye Enemy Airship. The song. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I worked at Sonic Boom, and uh, we used to have bands play. Uh, we've set up a stage when we expanded the store, and we used to have bands play. And it was a record store day. And my daughter had just been born. She was like a little tiny baby. And... I was working in the record store day, and that's always mental chaos. It's just, in, it's insanity. But we have bands playing the whole day. Uh, the, the boss at Sonic would order pizza, like like hundreds of pizzas. It's like free for the, the crowd. Um, and uh, I don't want to say the name of the band because they're kind of like a, a it was kind of a, a score that they, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they agreed to do it. And so I was walking back into the storeroom to get some some stuff, uh, like some stock that needed to get restocked during record store day, which was the, again like mayhem. And the guitar player from this band, I, I so desperately want to say it, but it's like uh, I, whatever. Just a, just a, just know that it's like you've heard them on the radio, uh, okay. mostly like the indie rock radio stuff. They were like, uh, I like them, but they're painfully indie rock. It's like just paint by numbers indie rock. Girls love them. It's just whatever. Uh, they're all pretty as well. And he, I walked by their guitar player and he was like, hey, man, uh, like you play it, do make say think. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, I love good by any mirrorship, man. Uh, or is it the landlord is dead? I don't know. The one that goes down, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. And so he uh, he starts playing it for me, but he's playing it in regular tuning. Now, that song is in an alternate tuning. You know, the strings are in like a drop C all the way down. Like it's a, okay. a tuning that it's like a tuning that I made up. And uh, so he's playing it in regular tuning and his hands are like doing all these like wicked ass chords. And he's just like moving up and down. And it's just like and he's playing it perfectly. And he's like, I don't know, like, you must, like, you know, you must be an awesome guitar player. Like, how did you come up with that riff? Like, it's, like, so difficult, and you're pulling these chords. And I was like, uh, yo, dude, it's an alternate tuning, and I use one finger. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just like, what? And then I tuned his guitar into the tuning, and I showed him, and it's, like, this finger. <laughs> and I play it on. <laughs> oh, wow. And he was like. Oh my God! And I, and I was like, "Well, wait, like, good on you, man. You, like, you learn the riff. Like, you're making me look really good." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that good. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, just got to make your guitar sound different, and then, you know. Yeah. Do you use a lot of alternative uh, tunings on different songs? Yeah, we do, and that's why we have to take uh, like seven guitars on tour. Because you put them in the alternate tunings, and then they got a set in that alternate tuning, so they're not out of tune when you pick them up to play them. So we have like the drop C, uh, the the drop like F seventh, like whatever. It just you know we yeah. have all, like all these you know uh, we have one that's like set in the standard um, like blue like drop D blues. You know okay. what I mean? Like yeah. just 
you know, and they just get set before a tour and we leave them set like that. We, well, we take them to get set up in that tuning. So we have a guy uh, here in Toronto, his name's Andy, works out of a place called Paul's Boutique. And he's our sort of our guitar tech guy, but he, we can't afford him to come on tour. So we just tune these guitars in a way they're supposed to be tuned and we take them to him and he gets them all set up and they sound great. Hmm. Because I, I feel like that would add, so it must be practice that's got you, because if I were playing a guitar, switch to a to keyboard or something, had to switch back to a guitar in a different tuning, I think my mind might explode, uh, <laughs> having to know what I, what I have to do next. You get pretty used to it. Yeah? Yeah, you get pretty used to it. It's not, it's not. It, it won't it won't melt your brain it, it it only it only melts your brain if uh you forget a step you know uh like at that show at danforth um you know remember we had that kind of like psychedelic background going on and we had all the the, the, the like uh all the different cameras. lights going up yeah the, all the and then we had those like black uh nighttime infrared cameras and our buddy was kind of like mixing some stuff on top of it and you'd see like charlie's face and then it would freeze and then it would kind of bend and okay. i think all the yeah. people that were stoned in the audience were getting their <laughs> they're <laughs> they're terrified of it and i remember at one point i was just like you know i'd begun to relax and 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 we were playing uh, we were playing Fredericia, and uh there's a part that comes up and it's kind of like a round. And as if somebody misses their moment, the drummers get confused. Like, okay. it's not the round, you know? And uh, I ended up at one point during that moment, looking up at the screen, waiting for my moment to come on. And the screen was just doing this amazing stuff. And then I looked over at Ohad and Charlie and they were staring at me like, <laughs> like you're supposed to be playing man like you're like you're, you're like at least two and a half rounds past where you're supposed to come in <laughs> so i jumped in and then the drummers uh like drummers are they just were like you know screw this guy we're just gonna we're just gonna keep plowing through just switching. like it's, yeah. it's your mistake man and if people catch on to it then nobody did though yeah <laughs> well nobody did. I, I feel like I'm surprised when you say that, too, because when I watch Do Make Say Think play, and maybe it's just because you're more animated than the rest of them, I feel like you're almost the composer where you're jumping into that next segment and you're almost leading people or you you feel like it's more based upon someone's playing. It, it's it, it's well, yeah, I'm more animated. I think Charlie is, too. Uh, about when and where the uh, uh, changes come. So our theory early on uh, was sort of based on, I'm not sure if you know this record, uh, The Shape of Jazz to Come by Ornette Coleman. No, I, I don't okay, know. Okay, so he made this record, The Shape of Jazz to Come, and it caused a lot of controversy in the jazz world back then because they kind of thought that he was being a bit too ego, uh, like to say, like, this is the new sound of jazz. And he was the one, or a, or a writer in the, at that time, coined the word free jazz. Uh, but really it's not. What it is is that he has like markers where everybody comes together. But in between those markers, go ahead. Like, do what you got to do. Like, just you okay. know, go, go, go crazy. Now, ours is a bit more structured than that, but we also uh, really believed in that theory. So basically the hand signals and the hand gestures are um, moments where it, it signals to the rest of the band, come back. Like yeah. you've gone off, you're like, you know, mostly, you know, the horn players, myself, uh, Charlie, you know, get to kind of go off a little bit more than say, uh, Ohad seems to be a bit more grounded as are the drummers. They They have like, they sort of just keep the foundation. Yep. But when somebody like lifts their hand and just goes like that, it's like four, three, two, one. And then we, we hit go. the next yeah. thing. Right? Uh, it, it, to that end, uh, there's also like super, super subtle ones. Like 
uh, will give the drummers sometimes like the ability to uh, to to make the change. Like in one, in a couple of songs, uh, like Jimmy will just do like a like a simple like like really long snare roll and go like like just like that's your count in like you just okay. have to hear yeah. him get that hi-hat and then we all change so it's not like the audience doesn't see us the change coming yeah you know? or sometimes it's like uh i know when we start um uh um Aubers de la mouton noir it's the black sheep that's what it's called uh, okay. And it starts with like this like big country riff that Ohad and I play, and usually we come into it with a droney, spacey kind of thing, and I'll tape down the keys on the keyboard, and Julie, the violin player, will be playing like an alternate like chord note and make it really modal, and then I'll just turn to Ohad and I'll just turn my back to the audience and I'll and then he'll look over at me and I'll go, and then we'll and then we'll hit it, and then the crowd. Yeah often doesn't see it coming you know because i've like it's just like yeah just like a one two three and then boom so it's like it's fun like that it's 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 fun tricking you guys <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i just looked over i can't believe i'm getting really good with all this online teaching of just talking like sometimes to the screen for an hour and i said initially that it would be like 30 minutes and we're going on a, an hour and 15 minutes here <laughs> so i apologize i'll try and sum things up here that's um, cool man yeah yeah um, if, if for for a new guitarist is there a key thing that a new guitarist uh should maybe work on or practice or do in order to get better at guitar? Uh, find influences and put them in your heart. Like for me, uh, Neil Young is a big, big influence on my guitar playing. Now, Ohad appreciates Neil Young, but it's not definitely nowhere near where he wants to be. He's like into like, you know, classical Spanish flamenco and, you know, guys who can really play technically. Whereas Neil Young, that that's he doesn't play technically at all and so that's kind of you know i put that in my heart uh you know my old metal days i used to shred a lot so that kind of still is in there but not as much um yeah i just really like people like you know even like jim o'rourke who's like really experimental uh experimental ways of playing the guitar like the sonic like sonic youth um just, you know, you sort of get that in your heart and whether or not you're being taught by somebody, uh, it's just sort of like a great starting point if you're starting out. Like, it, you know, it just just listen to a lot of music and find the guitar players, uh, male or female, uh, you know, funky or metal, you know, jazzy or post-rocky, like just find something, someone that really speaks to you and, and 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 try to study them like try to study why it is that you like them and then and, and then learn from that and then immediately let them go and do your own thing like once you've learned kind of how you want to play uh uh because you if you go too deep you, you end up ripping them off and that's not good you got to have your own idea but like I said, with that guy who learned, you know, like good, uh, goodbye enemy airship, yeah, on like regular tuning, you know, obviously he wanted to learn that, and he found a way to do it, and it blew my mind because it was like so. It was really he was doing way too much work that he needed to do. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just find someone you love, learn their style, not their style, learn their, learn what's coming from their heart. You know, and then uh, uh, and then and then take that information and put it in your heart and do your own thing. You know, I know that St. Vincent is putting on a, a, a online course and I was kind of interested in taking that because her playing is like <laughs> it's totally mental. It's like oh, a cross okay. between like like it's like Devo meets like 
space music meets Frank Zappa, you know, it's just like it's totally out there and it's a wicked way of playing. And uh, uh, and it's so outside my wheelhouse that I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll take some lessons, like online lessons from her, you know? Yeah. Uh, or I wouldn't be direct. It would just be like I'd take her course. But um, it could be an option in the future. I can't just like rely on Neil Young all the time, right? Yeah, that's right. I won't. I wouldn't be growing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. I think I, I in hearing you say this too, I, and I've thought about this for other bands, I feel like some of the best bands have got these different components, like how you were saying you kind of listened in and, and uh, played with, with to Neil Young and Ohad was more classical. I feel like all these different components merged in a band is what almost gives a band its own unique sound as well. Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of also our score work stuff. Like Ohad is really getting into, uh, you know, traditional scoring, you know, like big strings and all this kind of stuff. And he is oft often, now that we're in this sort of pandemic lockdown, I'm working from home more than I am going into the studio with him and woodshedding. But he's just like, I need interesting noise underneath this stuff. Like, that's what I want from, that's what he wants from me. Like, he doesn't need me to, uh, try to compose, you know, harmonies and passing chords and, you know, all this kind of stuff. He's going to do that. He wants to do that by himself. He doesn't want me sitting behind him in the studio while he tries to figure that out. But what he does want is for me, you know, to do what I'm an expert at, which is create undercurrents and noise and strange sounds and sounds that you don't get when you just plug in like a, a keyboard and press one patch and there's your sound. He wants me to spend hours and hours like taking field recordings and making them music or uh, taking the, this, where did I put that screwdriver? Cause I'm gonna need it. Yeah, <laughs> this thing, you know, use this thing in a guitar but use it in an acoustic guitar, you know, like do stuff like that. Yeah. You know, and it's it's kind of fun. Like one of our favorite uh, guitar techniques, and this isn't going to be put online, is it? Because I don't want to give a secret away. Okay, I can cut <laughs> this part out. No, you don't have to. I mean, oh, yeah. whatever. But we have a, a we have a, a dedicated guitar we call the barbecue guitar, barbecue skewer guitar. And what we do is we uh, wedge uh, one up, one down. Uh, uh, of one barbecue skewer and then we do the opposite with another barbecue skewer and then we do a third near the end of the bridge and then we tune the guitar and then we put them on the 12th fret and the 5th fret and then all we do is take uh, a 4th barbecue skewer and hit them <laughs> Wow! and you hit them hard enough they make this like ungodly wild wave sound that uh, you know and that's that's what I do with my day job. Cool. That's <laughs> awesome. I like that word too, undercurrent. Or uh, like that was kind of what I'm thinking with your solo stuff and I what I imagine that you can be adding to all these tracks. Yeah. The only, um, the only problem is when we get to the mix stage, a lot of mixers go, uh, and then fade her down. <laughs> so the, all the noise gets kind of just atmospheric in the background. Uh, whereas when we compose it, it's usually like up at the forefront. But yes, there you go. Yeah. What are you gonna do? <laughs> and then maybe just one more, just my own interest. Sure. Um, I noticed on your solo stuff, there's two tracks uh, called. There's a part one and a part two called "Stubborn Persistent Illusions." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did they? Did they? Were they an influence for the "Do Make Say Think" album? Uh, yeah, we, um, we always have a hard time naming our songs and naming our albums. And Charlie came up with this really cool, like, Buddhist poem. It's on the insert. Um, yeah. And uh, when I was doing that, that, that what you're talking about is this thing I did, which I was challenging myself to do a song a week. So it's in like, so you get like summer, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. And it's like basically all. 52 but actually there's 53 songs because i forgot that i forgot to stop oh. um, so uh uh stubborn persistent 
Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> Sovereign Persistent Illusions um, came from a, a film that we were, Ohad and I were working on called How to Build a Time Machine. And he was uh, one, <laughs> one of the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the subjects that they were talking to was a, was a filmmaker. And he was talking about how uh, film it's in of itself is a time machine. Because you look at old films, and those people could be like long dead, yet they still live. Like you, you're going back in time to watch this person effectively alive. And he just goes, it's a stubborn, persistent illusion. It lasts forever. And I was like, what a great, what a great, I <laughs> like, what a great thing. And so I wrote these like pieces, and I just named it part one and part two. And then when we were naming the album, Charlie brought this poem forward, and I was like, <laughs> that's a stubborn, persistent illusion. And they both all went like, there it is. <laughs> cool. there's, there's the album title. And I, I was okay with that, you know, because we had already spent a month trying to name this record, and I was just like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds as good as any. And it kind of makes sense to the Buddhist poem, so... I was happy about that. Like you should have heard some of the titles that were floating around. It's, oh my god! So uh, you know, you, you know, you know when you do something, you think, oh, I could have really embarrassed myself if I had done that. Like yeah, yeah. maybe you were drunk at a party and you're like, I'm gonna take a shower in this person's, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like you lock you get into the bathroom you start taking your pants off and you're like wait a second you know i think something comes in your head and goes ah oh, that's not such a good idea i don't think i should be doing that and then uh and then you don't and then about a year later you run into the person holding the party and you kind of shudder you're like oh crap i'm so glad i didn't do that <laughs> so those are some of the album titles that we were like oh my god remember when we were going to name the record this that Juno, we would have saw that Juno fly away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think we would have been nominated had we chose some of those old album co titles. <laughs> That's funny. I always wondered, like, because it's mainly instrumental. So what what was kind of the process in, in naming the albums and the song titles? And... Yeah, pure agony. <laughs> it's, just, it's just it's like so much fighting. So much like it's just uh, it's the worst. If we could, uh, <laughs> I at one point was like so fed up with the uh, with the with the the fighting over what to name the album that I said I one time came up with this idea. I was like, oh, I got it. Why don't we just don't name it anything, and we don't name the songs, and we don't tell anybody what's side A or side B, but we put at the back of the record like these, you know lines and, and and the fans can name the record that with how they want to and then they can oh. name, you know and then they can name the songs whatever they want on whatever side they like to start and that's the way it is and they were like how do we sell that record right like, yeah it'll be called blank <laughs> like, how do we even you know like they were like you must hate money like <laughs> how do we even begin to like ugh. yeah and they were right i mean it's good i might put out a record solo record of like just use that concept for that yeah because i it's not that i don't like paying my mortgage or feeding my daughter but you know i'm not in this for the money as you can probably well imagine do makes a think it's not not a money-making venture it's the venture of love so whenever i tell my wife like we're gonna go on a small tour she's just like Okay, well, at least don't come back owing them money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. When, when it's at that show, it's, it's happened, man. Well, <laughs> I was going to say that show in Toronto was jam packed. That I yeah, was it was a good one. Yeah. We, we actually came home with some money on that one, but uh, <laughs> uh, immediately lost it all on the subsequent tour that we did. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for taken all this time i apologize for it going so long this Pot of sweat, man. no worries it was a it was a pleasure it seems like it just flew by for me so <laughs> nice well i don't know if you could hear that dog barking in the background that means i'm off to the park for a walk so okay yeah i got one upstairs that i gotta do the same thing for so <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rob. That was amazing. Like, it was a lot of fun to do. And uh, uh, I hope you don't, don't have too much trouble editing this down to a, a reasonable lesson. <laughs> All right, Rob. Be well, man. Okay, ciao. How do I turn? How do I turn this thing off? <laughs>